My name is Chris, and I'm going to be talking about text editor and uh, Tmux, which is a terminal multiplexer. So before I do that, let me introduce myself, and I'm going to keep going back to my keyboard uh, because my remote's not working. Uh, so I have recently moved, uh, in the last three years, I've lived in three different cities. I've moved from Seattle to San Francisco, and then last month, I moved, this is the financial district. Uh, I'm pretty sure those guys are on their way to go buy a startup. I moved to <laughs> Portland, Oregon uh, last month. That's my fiance, and that's my dog, Baxter. <coughs> And uh, I now work for a distributed team, which means I work with a lot of people that are nowhere near me. So I have two developers I work with in San Diego, and I also work with a couple other people in Portland, um, which is good and bad. It's good because I can go days without actually leaving the house. Um, it's, uh, well, I guess that's probably a bad thing. Uh, but it's good uh, because I get to work with lots of different types of people. So um, that's me. In addition to writing code, I'm also uh, really, 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 really into photography. So if you, have, uh, if you get tired of talking about code, want to talk about photos uh, or anything else, please do. OK. So let's start talking about some, uh, some Tmux and Vim. Uh, before we do that, I want to talk about some of the tools that you might already be using today if you're not using Vim and Tmux. And the first is RubyMine. So who uses RubyMine on a pretty regular basis? <coughs> like five, three people. OK. So <laughs> that's cool. I mean, I've actually worked with uh, teams that have used nothing but RubyMine. Um, and uh, RubyMine is relatively new. Uh, it came out in 2009, and it's about 99 bucks if you wanted a license to use it. This is how it looks. Um, this honestly gives me a headache if I have to use this all day because there's just a lot of stuff going on. On the left-hand side is RubyMine. We have a file tree. We have tabs, buttons, widgets, Wismos. On the right-hand side, we have a uh, Rails server and our Rails console, things that we kind of need to have open if you're working on a Rails app. The thing I hate the most, though, about this is I have this teeny tiny little area that I get to work in all day, this little box where I do my coding. Um, not, not a lot of fun. Um, who uses Sublime Text? This is another editor. So way more people. This is really popular. Sublime Text has actually been around longer than RubyMine, but nobody I know started using it until last year when Sublime Text 2 was released um, in 2012. Uh, Sublime Text is 70 bucks, so it's cheaper. Uh, it's also a lot simpler, but still very powerful. This is how Sublime Text looks. This is the exact same window. I still have my terminals open, but now I have Sublime Text, a much bigger typing area. And we can actually have a, a dark, well, I believe we can probably do a dark color scheme on RubyMine, but here we have a whole dark interface. So in my eyes, it's a good thing. We still have the giant Mac OS menu bar on the top, which I find distracting. Uh, we are able to still run our tests within Sublime Text, so that's cool. We get some of the IDE goodness that we might get from RubyMine, but still, uh, I'm not a fan of this. This is not ideal. I, I still find it very distracting. So now we move to the magical Vim and Tmux. <laughs> uh, who, who uses Vim and Tmux already? OK, so I could basically just be done now. because <laughs> So most people are already using this. Hopefully, you find some good stuff. Uh, but more so, hopefully, you see something I did totally wrong, or you know a better way of doing this, and you can show me. That'd be good. That'd be good, too. So Vim and Tmux, uh, I've already said kind of what they are. Vim is a text editor. Tmux is a terminal multiplexer, meaning that it just is like a windowing system for your terminals. You can stick a bunch of different apps in and, and manage those and move them around in panes and windows and uh, keep everything in the same place. Vim will run in the terminal, so it too can be managed by Tmux. So let's look at Vim and Tmux. Ah, this is way better. Uh, this is a full screen screenshot. We don't have the Mac OS menu bar because everything is running in the terminal. We're able to just run it full screen and focus on one thing at a time. So on the bottom there, we're going to be looking at the bottom of the screen a lot, so I apologize if, if you can't see this. Um, at the bottom there is my, is my status bar. We can still quickly open up files, just like we can in our other two editors. We can still run our tests from within the editor, so we still have a lot of the benefits. We still have our console running that we can type into, and we still have our Rails server running. So we have all the same cool stuff, um, but it's not in our face all the time. So this is, this is definitely um, how I like to work. This is great. Everything's got the same font, same color schemes. Really cool. OK, so let's move along. Tmux. So I've already told you what it is. Let's see how to use it. The first thing you're going to want to do is get it installed. Uh, I already have it installed, so I got an error. But uh, you probably don't have it installed, so you can do this unless you're already using it. The next thing we want to do with Tmux is create a new session. The way Tmux works is the server running on your machine. And you can create sessions on it, and then your terminal acts as a client to those sessions. So even if you close your terminal, your session will still be there. So this is really helpful if you, uh, say, connect to your development box or whatever, and you open up a session and do all this cool stuff. 
you can close your terminal and come back later and resume that session. So we're going to create a new session called Ancient City. And now we're in Tmux land. So it looks exactly the same as the terminal we were just looking at, except we have a status bar on the bottom. And in my status bar on the left, I have my session name. And then I have the list of all my windows. And then on the right-hand side, I have the host name of the machine I'm connected to. Uh, when you have multiple sessions, this is sometimes important. And then on the right-hand side, again, I have the, the date and the time. This status bar is totally configurable. Anything that has output, you can stick in your status bar. I've seen other things like um, CI, so uh, a little green heart if your build is good, and then it kind of goes back and forth. Yes. Uh, I've also seen weather scores, or, or uh, weather reports, uh, sports scores, uh, email counts, DMs on Twitter, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to get started with Tmux and you're not really sure uh, where to get started, here's a link to my Tmux configuration. And I'll show this later, so you don't have to write it down right now. But this will have that status bar in there and um, give you kind of a, a starting point. There's a ton of comments, too. So that uh, should be helpful. Also in there is going to be my keyboard shortcuts. So that's why I'm not going to like put keyboard shortcuts on the screen, because you can change them to whatever you want. So it's kind of pointless for me to share them. OK. So getting organized. So now we know what Tmux is. Let's see how to use it to organize some windows. So we are in our Tmux session. And it is almost lunch, so it's time to start working. Uh, first thing we're going to want to do is type IRB. So now we can start writing some code, right? If you're like me, you have a lot of um, stuff that you work on that, does, uh, that takes time. And you prefer for that stuff to run in the background. So we're going to prepare for that and create a new window. Uh, oh, I forgot to explain this, sorry. Um, so notice we started IRB. The window name has changed to Ruby. Tmux will automatically find the process name and stick that down to name your window. If you wanted to, you can name that to something uh, more relevant. So we can rename this, this tab to IRB. OK, so now we're going to create a new window. We can do this with a keyboard shortcut. And in this window, we're going to have some games ready to go, just in case. Just in case uh, we're doing something in IRB that takes a while. So we're going to rename our, our window to games. And then we're going to play some games. I installed uh, yesterday a really awesome gaming library. It's called Emacs. So I'm going to <laughs> start up a text adventure. If you haven't played this, you should, because it only takes about three hours to beat. Um, but Tmux also allows us to create multiple panes inside of our window. So we have a second pane over here where we can start a second game. So we'll fire up Emacs again. Uh, and now we can start a game of Tetris. Yes. Very fun. OK. Uh, OK, so now we want to write code. So we still have our window running. We could go right back over to that window and start writing out our Ruby. In this case, we're just uh, doing something really interesting and adding up the first 100 million numbers. So this is going to take a while. So while this is running, we can go back to our game. It's still running in the background, playing Tetris, and boom. OK, did you see the flash? Did you guys see the bottom part flash? Um, when, team, when there's a change in the window, uh, in any other window, Tmux is going to flash the status bar, and then it's going to change the background of the window that has an update for you. So notice it's a white background now on IRB. If we go to that window, we can see the, the results been calculated. So this is really cool. We can use Tmux to organize all the stuff we're working on and ignore that it's there. And then when there's actually an update that we need to pay attention to, Tmux will tell us. So if you're connected to another machine via SSH and you get disconnected, or if you're uh, tailing a log, repping a log for errors or something like that, and um, you want to know when an error pops up, you can just kind of forget it's there and um, pay attention to your, to your status bar. You don't need to keep checking it. I'm going to grab a drink real quick. OK, so scripting. This is, real, this is one of the really cool parts about Tmux that nobody ever uses. Um, all of the stuff that we just looked at that we can do with Tmux, we can do that um, via scripts. We can ask Tmux to do that on the command line. We don't need to use keyboard shortcuts. So we are now in a Rails app, and we want to start a Rails server in a new window. We can use the tmux new window command to do that. So we're going to create a new window called server and start the Rails server. tmux will create that window for us and then start the server. Um, that's cool. So now we can do another one. We'll go back to our first window and create a new window for our console. Cool. So in, uh, in practice, I would never do that, because I can just use keyboard shortcuts. But you can take those same commands and stick them in a script, so that this kind of stuff can be automated later. So here's an example of a script that you might use. This is a simple one, but um, it, it shows the example well. This is for like a Rails app. 
we can create a new session, and then we can create three windows for that session, one for the server, one for the console, and one for Vim. And then finally, we can attach ourselves to that session. So we'll run the script real quick to see how that works. First, we have detached from our Tmux session we were just in, the ancient city one. Notice our status bar is no longer there. And now we're going to run our script. So we go into our project directory, run the Tmux, and <coughs> boom. That's awesome. So notice our uh, name is down there just as we've asked it to be. We have four windows already ready to go. The first one has got the terminal. The second one's got the Rails server running. Our Rails console's running in the third. And then finally, Vim is ready. And it's in our project directory, so we can just start, start writing code. This is really cool. This is helpful if you have um, uh, complicated test suites or other services you depend on. You can get all those things fired up, maybe um, SSH to a couple machines, whatever. Um, this is an easy way to set up different development environments for your apps. Those are uh, most of the features I use of Tmux on a daily basis. If you want to learn more about Tmux, this is a really good book on Pragmatic Bookshelf. It is by Brian Hogan. First time I've read who it's by. OK. <laughs> Moving on. Now we know how to use Tmux. Let's learn how to use Vim. So we're going to go over some of the stuff that you're probably used to doing in your other editors, and then some other stuff that your other editors probably can't do or maybe can do. I'm not sure. So a quick intro. Most everybody in here has probably used Vim, but we're still going to do an intro just in case somebody hasn't. We don't want to have them be completely lost. So we are inside Tmux now, uh, and we want to start Vim. You can do that by using the vi command. You might actually have to use Vim depending on your installation, but vi is going to work for us on Mac OS. Now we're in Vim. So the basic things that you want your text editor to be able to do is open a file, add text or change text in the file, and then write those changes. So we're going to look at those three things really quickly. Um, uh, Vim operates on modes. So by default, we've started, and Vim is in what's called normal mode. So this is really confusing to people who first start using Vim because you can't actually type. People will start typing, and it, it, it does weird things like select text or delete text or save your file or quit Vim or whatever, and it's, it's extremely confusing. So just remember when you start up, you're not in a mode where you can type. You're in normal mode. Um, other modes you're going to be using all the time are visual mode, which is where you're selecting text. Uh, command line mode, which is where you're in the bottom corner of Vim's command line entering, entering commands. And then insert mode, where you're actually inserting text. So let's do those three things I talked about. Um, to open a file, we're going to press the colon key. That puts us in the command line mode. Now we're in the lower left-hand corner on Vim's command line. And we'll type edit math.rb, so e math.rb. So we want to edit a file called math.rb. Now we're ready to type, so we enter insert mode. You do that by pressing the i key. Notice my status bar has changed to bright green. That's, uh, Vim doesn't do this by default, but I love being able to know what mode I'm in. So this is something I've just stuck in my VimRC. It's like one line. It's really simple. Um, you can check that out. Now we're in insert mode, so I'm going to start typing. And we are writing a add method for Ruby's math module. So really cool. Almost done. Yes. OK, so we are now done typing. So we want to get out of insert mode. So we're going to use the escape key to get out of insert mode. Finally, we want to write our changes. So we're going to go back down to the command line and use the w command. So colon, w for write, and our file's changed. <coughs> OK, so that's the Vim basics. Probably everybody already knew how to do that. So let's move along to something else. Here's my VimRC. This is, has the uh, status bar changes that we looked at. It's also got a bunch of other things that I like in Vim. You may not like them, so please don't just copy it. Otherwise, you might be very confused. Um, but there are lots of comments so you know what um, the configuration is doing. OK, the next thing. So we heard today a great talk about testing. So let's see how to make that a uh, good thing in Vim. <clears throat> uh, we already know how to open files. Um, so we looked at the uh, math library just a second ago. Let's test drive that. So we'll write a test, we'll run our test, and, and we'll actually test drive that method we looked at. And we'll do it from within Vim. So the first thing we need to do when starting a new library is we need to create a couple directories. We want to create a lib directory to put our code in and a spec directory to put our tests in, right? So we can do that in Vim. We'll use the colon key. Notice we're in the bottom left-hand corner, and we're just using the bash make dir command. In Vim, we can run any shell command we want. We just use a, we proceed it with an exclamation mark to tell uh, Vim we'd like to shell out to run this. So we run that, and now we have our two directories. So next thing we want to do is write a spec. So we can do that again by going to the command line. And we're going to edit our spec file, math spec. And now we can start writing out the test. 
So this will look uh, very clear to people who have used RSpec before. We're just requiring our math library that doesn't exist yet. And then we're going to describe the add method with one example, adding two numbers. Okay, we expect two plus four to equal six. That makes sense. All right, the next thing we want to do is run our test. If we're using something like uh, RubyMine, there's probably a button for this, uh, uh, but we're not. Um, if we're using um, Sublime Text, there's a keyboard shortcut you could use to, to run the file, and I think it's aware of whether you're running a spec or not. In Vim, we can do the same thing. So um, you can press comma T. This doesn't do this by default, but again, this is very simple. It's basically going to shell out, like we saw when we made a directory, run our spec, and then we can see the results. Um, it has some other magic in here, too. For example, if you're not currently on a spec file and you press comma T, um, then it's going to run the last spec that you ran. So that enables you to bounce around between files and continue running the same spec. So we're going to press comma T. Our spec runs. And this is uh, an error, right? We don't have our math library yet. So now we need to create that math library. We're going to come down here in the command line, create the math library, run our test again. And now we have a failure. So we don't have our method add, so now we can add the method add. OK. Now we can hello? That was weird. Sorry. Now we can run our test again, so we're going to press comma T. We have another failure. Expect 6 got nil, so we'll stick a 6 in there. Run our test again. Green. <laughs> OK, so this is obviously not the code we want. Uh, so we need to write another test. Um, Vim is actually keeping track of every place my cursor has been and every file I've had open. So if we want to go back to our spec file to add another test, we press Control O. The way I remember this is um, I try to visualize the files I've opened as a stack. And I don't know why, why Control O makes sense, but I, I imagine going out to the previous file. So if I press Control O, I go back to my spec file. And now we can write another spec so that we actually get some code that we think <coughs> is going to be right. We're just going to do adding two negative numbers now. Very good. We'll now run our test again with comma T. And we got a failure, just as we expected. Time to go back to our uh, implementation code. So instead of pressing Control O for out, I think go in. So Control I is what you're going to press to do this. This goes the other direction in Vim's, in Vim's stack of where your cursor's been. It sounds very confusing, but um, just get, you'll get used to it, I promise. Give it a try. So now we go back, and we can finish writing out the code that we think is going to make the test pass. Run it again, and we're green. So that's testing in Vim. Um, Pretty straightforward. What I really like about this approach, I've seen people use, um, I, I was just talking to somebody about this yesterday, I've seen people use splits, for example, to show their test results. Um, I, for me, I, I can really only do one thing at a time, so it's nice to have just like looking at one thing at a time. You're looking at your code, you run your test, you're just looking at your results, it's very clean and pretty, you're just looking at your um, um, test and your code, and it, you know, it, it makes sense. You don't need to have everything on the screen at once. Um, so it's very focused. All right, moving along, search. Something we do all the time in our editors is search for stuff. So I'm going to show you how to search in Vim and how to do replacements in Vim. So here's the math library that we've been looking at, except notice my variable names are horrible. They're single letter variable names. So we want to do a search and replace to fix that. We want to replace L with left and R with right. So to start a search in Vim, you will use the forward slash key. That'll bring you down into the command line down here again, and you can type out what you'd like to search for. So if we search for L, you'll notice we get four L's. This is obviously not exactly what we want to search for, but it, it's, it's pretty close. To go through your search results, keep hitting the N key, and you'll just keep toggling through your search results. If you have a huge file, this is really, really useful to find all the cases of something in a file. OK, so let's refine our search a little bit so that we're only getting the variable names. We're not getting every single L in the file. You can perform it. We're down here in the left-hand corner. Forgot to add a big bright red arrow. Um, we are searching for just the word L now, um, which you probably can't see that. What we're doing is we're using a left caret, L, and a right caret. That's Vim's way of saying, find the word L. Vim supports all kinds of regular expressions, so you can make really complicated queries if you like. So if we do this search, 
we now have just the two things we're looking for. So the next step we want to do is replace. We want to replace the L with the word left. So we are going to use a command to do this. We will enter the command line mode, and we're going to use percent %s, which means search the whole file. And we're going to tell it what to search for and what to replace it for. So in this case, we've already done our search. So I've left our search term completely blank, because Vim will just remember the last thing we searched for. And I put left in there as what I'd like to replace it with. Next, we can stick two parameters on the end. Um, if you'd like, I stick um, G on here to say replace everything, every occurrence in the file, not just the first one you find. And then also a C, which means we want a confirmation for our search and replace. So every time you're going to do a replacement, ask me before you do it. So when we press Enter, our first result's highlighted. Vim is asking us if we'd like to make the replacement. We hit yes, and then we'll hit yes one more time, and we're done. So we're going to do this one more time, but we're going to do it way quicker. <laughs> um, we're going to do it for R. So instead of doing the search first and then the replacement, we'll just do it all in one command. So we're in the bottom left here again. We're searching for the word R. We're going to place it with right, and then stick the same two parameters on there, and we're done. So search and replace uh, in Vim. It's very, very easy. OK, um, the second to last thing I want to talk about in Vim is macros. This is something I've never seen any other editor do. And if they do it, they do it totally different. Um, a Vim macro is, is basically a recording of everything you do. And you can save it um, to any key you'd like and then replay that. You can replay it on one line. You can replay it on five lines. You can replay it in multiple files. It's extremely powerful for little annoying tasks that you need to do over and over and over again. Um, so here's an example. Uh, I have a, a table here. These are of my friends. The first column is last name. Second column is first name. Uh, and the last column is the year they were born. Before we get started with macros, uh, this list is out of order. So I'd like to sort it. So this is how you can quickly sort in Vim. We'll press VIP to visually select the paragraph that our cursor is on. And then we can run a command. So I'll enter command line, and I'll type sort. Now our list is sorted. And this works on many different types of text and input. So it's really cool that we can um, sort like that. OK, now it's time to record our macro. So what I'd like to do on the end of each line is put the person's age in parentheses. So imagine I was popular and I had thousands and thousands of friends. This would probably take me the rest of my life to do this, right? Um, because not only do you need to type it out, but you need to figure out the age of each person based on the year they were born. So instead, we're going to record a macro. So the first step in recording a macro is telling Vim you want to record a macro. So to do that, you press the Q key, followed by where you'd like to save the macro, which register you'd like to save it in. So I usually just press Q, Q, because it's fast. So we're going to save, we're going to start recording a macro, and we're going to save it in the Q register. So Q, Q, we're recording. If you look in the bottom left, Vim's going to tell you that, it, that you're recording. If you use Vim on a regular basis, you've probably seen that you've been recording and you didn't know you were recording. <laughs> Uh, so that's what that means. You're recording a macro. Um, so now it's time to actually record our macro. Vim is aware that we are wanting to record a macro, so we start typing what we want to do. The first thing we want to do is go to the end of the line, so we'll hit a dollar sign. Now we're on top of the year they were born, so we'd like to copy that so we can use it later for some math. So we're going to press YIW to yank the word that our cursor is on. Now that's saved off and stored somewhere in a register. We can use it later. Next, we're going to hit capital A to put us at the end of the line and put us in insert mode. So notice we have the bright green bar at the bottom. That's, uh, you could tell we're in insert mode. And now we can start typing. So we'll add that first parenthesis. Next thing we want to do now is, is figure out the age. So we actually have to do some math here. Uh, we can't just type. Uh, Vim can do math for us. It has what's called the expression register. So if we press Control R equal sign, that's going to take us back down into the bottom left-hand corner that we keep looking at. And uh, we now have an equals prompt. So we can type an expression. <coughs> Vim will evaluate it and stick it back up in our buffer. So we're going to type 2013 minus, and then we want to paste the year that we already copied. So we'll do Control R and then the double quote. So that gets pasted in. Now we have 2013 minus 2005. When you press Enter, we get the result, 8. So now we can just finish typing out the line. Looks good. We're done typing. So we'll get out of insert mode. We'll hit the Escape key. And I would say we're done now, but there's one more thing we want to do. Because we want to run this macro multiple times and chain it together, we'll finish our macro by moving to the next line. That way it just it automatically increments to the next line. So now we're done. Uh, so we'll hit the same key we used to start recording. We'll hit the Q key. Uh, notice in the corner it no longer says we're recording. 
OK. So we've got our macro. It's saved off. Time to replay it. You can replay a macro by using the at sign and then typing where you saved it to. So remember, we, plus, uh, we pressed in the beginning Q, Q, meaning we recorded a macro to the Q register. So to replay that macro, we'll do at Q. Done. And notice our cursor is already on the next line. So we have four more lines. We want to do this four more times. Instead of typing it four times, we can type four at Q, and it runs four more times. Done. So it's very easy. I love macros. OK, the last cool Vim thing, the argument list. Has anyone actually used the argument list before? Three people have used the argument list. Four people, OK. I just learned about this, so I'm actually still kind of excited about it. Um, this is the Vim argument list. Uh, uh, the argument list in Vim is a list of arguments. So <laughs> you can put, yes, done. The cool thing, though, is you could put any, um, any uh, file you want in Vim's argument list and then do stuff to that list. So all the things we've looked at, um, search and replace, macros, anything else you do in Vim, you can do across a whole big old set of files if you load them up in the argument list. Um, so we're going to go back to this wonderful, wonderful math library extension and um, practice the argument list. So let's say we've decided we no longer want to monkey patch math. We want to be good citizens and rename our module to something different. Uh, if we only had this one file, that'd be fine. We would just do a search and replace and be done with it. But we probably also have a spec, and we're probably using this file all over the place, right? So we need to do a search and replace across multiple files. This is exactly where the argument list is helpful. So let's do that. Um, the first thing we want to do is load up our argument list with all the files we want to do a search and replace on. So we enter command mode. We're in the corner. We're going to use the command args, A-R-G-S. And anything you put after that will be loaded into the argument list. So you can actually type file names. Or in this case, we're just going to um, shell out to bash and let um, the find command find all the Ruby files in the lib and the spec directory and load them into our argument list. So now our argument list is loaded up. If you want to see what files are in the argument list, just type the same exact command, go to the command line, type args with no parameters, and Vim's going to print out what's in the argument list. So we have two files. We have our library that we wrote, and we have our spec file that we wrote. That's good. Now we want to do our search and replace across all the files. So we'll enter the command line mode again. This time, we're going to use the arg do command, because we want to do something for each of the arguments. And then you just type out what you want to do for each of the arguments. So we're going to do a search for math, replace it with my math. And when we're done, we're going to write the file. So you press Enter. Vim does it. It'll tell you on the bottom that it did it. So it did it for two files. And then it opens the last file it worked on. So here's our spec. Notice we now have my math instead of math. If we look back at the actual module, we have my math here as well. Uh, this is a really cool feature. And you can use it, like I said, for macros as well. And since a macro can do anything, uh, you can do anything with the argument list. Uh, this is a quick section. I don't use a lot of plugins, but um, I want to share three that I do use all the time. So um, these are really, really useful. If you're in a Rails project, you're used to working with a bajillion files and having to open a bajillion files a second. So a plugin I use for that is called Control-P. Control-P can be activated. Um, how I've set it up in my VimRC, you might do something different. You press comma F, and you're going to get this giant little search box that pops up. You can start typing, and it's just going to do a fuzzy search to narrow down search results. When you find what you're looking for, press Enter. The file opens. That's Control-P. Um, the next plugin I want to talk about is searching through files. So that's how you would search for a specific file. Let's say you wanted to find a constant um, throughout your project. I would use Silver Searcher for that. Um, this can be activated by me pressing comma A. And then we're down in the command line, and we can type what we'd like to search for. Search will be performed. And we'll get all our results in a pane here at the bottom. When you find what you want to look for, again, just press Enter, and it'll open up for you. Last plugin I want to talk about is gist.vim. So I don't create a lot of gist, but when I do, this is really helpful. Let's say uh, we have our math library, this hypothetical math library, and we want to share it with somebody. A good way to do that is just to create a gist and then give them the URL. So I would usually just select the text and then go to GitHub and create the gist and then um, paste the URL and send it to them on email or chat or something like that. With gist.vim, uh, it's a lot shorter. We'll just enter the command line, type the word gist, and then a gist will be created, and our browser will open. So it's pretty cool. I love that. Uh, 
If you want to learn more about Vim, which there's way more to learn about Vim, this is a really good book. It's by um, Drew Neal, who also does a screencast series called Vimcasts. He hasn't done a new screencast in a while, but there's a ton on there that you can look at. Drew also has a workshop that he does, and you can work uh, in a small group of just a few people. I've done this myself, and it's awesome. That's actually where I learned about the argument list. Uh, and I didn't want to like reveal too much of his magic sauce, so I'll leave you with just that one. Uh, this is great. Uh, I know, like I said, there's one this month. There might be one um, after that as well. And finally, there is a new email group called VimSF. And when I was in San Francisco, um, that's how I uh, became aware of this. There's a meetup as well associated with this. So if you're in San Francisco, go to the meetups. If you're not in San Francisco, at least hop on the email list and you can hear some cool um, Vim tips as well. Uh, let me get a drink of water again. And then this will be the last thing we talk about today. <coughs> so remote pairing. Like I said, I work with uh, people that aren't sitting next to me. So this is extremely powerful tool to be able to do remote pairing, Vim and Tmux. Uh, how many people have tried doing remote pairing, either with Vim, Tmux, or anything else? So a lot of people. Who uses like a screen sharing apps, like Skype or um, nobody uses screen? Does everybody use Vim and Tmux already for this? OK, everybody does. OK, well, we'll show you how to do it anyway. Uh, this is a different way to do it. Um, unless uh, this is how you do it, let me know. Uh, the cool thing about using Vim and Tmux for remote pairing is we're not using a screen sharing app. That's like the best part, because you know how glitchy those are and how slow they are, right? Also, you'll have one person who's on their giant iMac sitting at home, and another person who's on 11-inch MacBook Air, and the poor person on the MacBook Air can't read any of the text, because it's a huge screen, and they're using VerbyMine, so it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we are going to see how to do a Tmux session. And the reason why this works so much better is because you're just using SSH. And you can use your own color scheme. You can use your own terminal. You can use your own font size. You can use your own font. You can feel way more comfortable. And the response when you're typing on someone else's machine is, is significantly faster. So the first thing you want to be able to do is create a new session that you can use to pair with somebody. By default, the session you create in Tmux is going to be uh, private, meaning that only you can access it, or other people in your user group. But if you're going to have um, somebody you trust, don't ever pair with somebody you don't trust. Um, if you have somebody um, <laughs> SSH into your machine, uh, then you're going to want to create a session that they too can connect to. So we're going to create a Tmux session, and we're going to tell Tmux to, to store that session in slash temp slash pair. Then we're just going to change the permissions of it so that anybody can read and write it, and then we'll connect to it. So now we're going to attach ourselves to that session that now anybody can look at. OK, so we're in. So this looks exactly like all the other Tmux sessions we've been using, because it is. Um, the next thing we're going to do is see how um, our friend or whatever, um, in my case, I'm going to be using Louisa as an example. She's my fiance, and she will be pairing with me. She is on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side is the terminal we've just been looking at. Um, this is me. So notice I'm still on my Tmux session. She just SSH'd into my machine, and now she wants to start working. So she has to connect to the Tmux session. So she's going to use the exact same um, Tmux command I used, attach, and tell it what session to attach to. And now she's attached. So we both have the exact same session name, and we're both ready to go. Anything she types, I'll see on my side. Anything I type, she'll see on her side. Notice, too, we each have our own color scheme. We're actually using different terminals. Uh, it's pretty awesome, and it's very fast. OK, so we're done. Um, let's talk about the scenario now where you have me at home, working from home in my pajamas on my giant iMac, and I'm pairing with somebody who's at work on an 11-inch uh, MacBook Air. How does Tmux handle that? So here's this scenario uh, uh, demonstrated on one screen. Uh, we have me, who's running a bigger terminal, Louisa, who's running a teeny tiny little terminal. Um, notice I have a green border here. That's Tmux's way of saying, this is your typing area. I can't type outside of that. As she makes her terminal smaller, my typing area also gets smaller. My resolution is not changing, my font's not changing, but my typing area is changing. Uh, when she makes it bigger, my typing area gets bigger as well. So we can be working in completely different size terminals, and uh, the person on the larger screen will just kind of not be able to type outside of the area that the other person can see. When she disconnects, then my little green border goes away, and I'm all by myself again um, working in the session. Uh, so that's all I got. That's Vim and Tmux. Uh, if you, looks like a lot of people are already using it, so hopefully you learned something. Uh, but somebody that isn't using it, I would recommend you try it. Um, it's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun. 
It feels really crazy at first, uh, but I promise it'll be worth it. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or hit me up on Twitter or something like that. Um, thanks.